That's fine. Okay. Okay. So this is called Area G of Jerusalem. We're focusing on, the, on this because there's a lot of stuff here from the time of the Churban, from the time of the destruction. What we have over here is actually very interesting, actually, with this person. is this little room over here. It's called the Burnt Room. And the Burnt Room, in that Burnt Room, we found 50 bulas. Close to 50 bulas. The bula is the signature ring when you're signing documents back then. Now think, yeah, 3,000 years ago, and you have a document, you have a, they didn't use paper, but they had parchment, and you would take the parchment, wrap it round, and then you would want to sign it. And so you'd want to sign it, you'd have this uh, piece of clay and you would uh, press your name onto it. And so we have a lot of names from back then, close to 50 different names. And we recognize some of them from Sefer Yirmiyahu, speaks about the Hurban a lot. And in Sefer Yirmiyahu, we have um, somebody called Gedaliahu ben Pashkur and Yehoyachal ben Shalmiya. These guys were actually people who advised the king back then, King Tzidkiyahu, to kill Yirmiyahu Hanavi. Tzidkiyahu couldn't kill Yirmiyahu. What he did is he threw him into a pit with sinking sand, and the Chastei Shemaim Yirmiyahu was saved later on. Let's see this a little closer. Okay. So right next to the burnt room, we have what's called Achiel's house. We're looking at the same thing, just from different angles. Like you see a guy standing here on the side. There's a house over here called Achiel's house. How do we know that Achiel lived here? Because there's a piece of um, pottery that has his name on it. And so what's actually interesting is on the side of this house, we find something that's very important to understanding the Khurban. I'm going to, okay, here are the bulas, by the way, the bulas that we spoke about, the different names that we have. How did they survive so many years? These bulas are in excellent condition. It's very unusual for bulas to survive 3,000 years. In this condition, it's a piece of clay that was stamped. And so the reason for this is actually because of the Khurban. Okay, this is uh, something, maybe something positive. If you could say that it came from the Khurban, because you had these pieces of clay, and because there was a fire over there, because the Bukhanetra set fire to Yerushalayim, what happened is it singed these bulas and hardened them. And today we can see the names very clearly thanks to that. So if you could say that there's something positive about the Hurban in any way, say it about this, so that the burnt house is, to, the burnt room is to the right, not the burnt house. Do not be mistaken with the burnt house. The burnt house is by Shani, second temple period, and it's up, it's higher than the coastal, it's up in the Jewish quarter. Okay, so the burnt house is on the right. Straight ahead over here is Achiel's house. And between this burnt room and Achiel's house, we're gonna, we have something that we can see over here actually in the picture very clearly. This square thing on the ground with the hole in the middle. This is actually a toilet from 3,000 years, uh, 2,600 years ago from the time of the Khurban, Khurban by Rishon, about 2,600 years ago, maybe 2,500 years ago, it depends, uh, it depends on a lot, of, uh, a lot of debate about that. But in any event, we have over here a toilet, and there's no running water back then, so what they had was a toilet with a big hole at the bottom, and once every few months, the slave would have to clear that out. And when the archaeologists found this, 
they found it full with feces and fossilized already most of them and they brought it to the lab to look through it and to understand what went on in Yerushalayim, what did people eat? And so on the lower levels, they actually found Yerushalayim Besif Arta. Jerusalem back then was a rich city, a city where people could afford to eat Nile fish, fish from the Nile. This is something we didn't even know that was possible. How are you eating fish from the Nile 2,600 years ago? How do you bring it from the Nile? The Nile's not, not right here. It's, you, you have to travel, so you have to salt it, you have to um, take care of it, you have to cure, cure it. And how was that done? We didn't know that it, was, uh, that it was even possible, but here you see it. You see, uh, when they look in the lab, they can see that that's what they ate back then. And that's um, very, very exciting to connect to the people back then. Now, on the higher levels, on the more recent layers of this toilet, what they found was that you had um, string beans that people were eating, uh, just beans and, and simple things because there was a matzar, because Nebuchadnezzar came on Asar Batavis, he surrounded Yerushalayim, and he put down a siege that lasted for two years. It took him two years till Yerushalayim collapsed. They had food there, but it was simple food. Before then, they could afford Nile perch, but at the end, there was starvation, and people were so hungry that actually they opened the doors on their own account on, in Tammuz, was it Zayn Tammuz? Shivasa with Tammuz is, has to do with Bais Shani. And we're focusing now on Bais Rishon. This is not going to be long, this uh, tour. Just going to go, go to around uh, 1040 or so. And we are going to move on over here and see other stuff that have to do with Bias Rishon. Here you can see the toilet up close. And uh, the virtual tours, I like to give more of a feeling of uh, actually on a bus and going, uh, going and moving places. But we actually were in Jerusalem, so it's, we're not going too far. Now you go to the Damascus Gate. Next to the Damascus Gate, you have this. This is a site that most people don't even know about. This is called Tzidkiyahu's cave. Tzidkiyahu was the last king, the last king in Jerusalem. Tzidkiyahu ruled right to the end. And when the Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, Tzidkiyahu actually had a secret way to escape. He had a tunnel. And Chazal tell us his tunnel went all the way to Yericho, all the way to Jericho. Mara Tzidkiyahu, we can see part of Mara Tzidkiyahu of today. Now the Midrash says like this, that Tzidkiyahu went into this tunnel and he ran towards Yericho. He was going to escape the Babylonians totally. But Mishamayim, they said Tzidkiyahu has to be caught by Nebuchadnezzar. So as Tzidkiyahu is running in the cave, the Babylonian soldiers on top saw a deer or a gazelle. A tzvi. They saw a gazelle, they started chasing him. That's a good meal, a gazelle. And so they're chasing the gazelle, and Tzidkiyahu, underneath them, parallel to them, in this tunnel, is running away, and they're running on top. And so when he got to Jericho, they actually got, they found the gazelle right over there, and then they saw him come out of his hiding cave, out of the secret uh, tunnel, and they arrested him and took him to Nebuchadnezzar, who later on actually uh, killed his sons in front of him and took out his eyes. Terrible, terrible story. But you can see this, this cave that's claimed to have to do with Tzidkiyahu. Um, most of the cave looks like it was uh, quarried in the Roman period. It's a massive cave. And um, I'm sure most of you have not even been here. You have to go next to the Damascus Gate, and then there's an entrance to, these, to this beautiful cave. You can see here, there's a little bit of a diagram to get an idea. It goes under the Muslim quarter. And we're not sure how far it goes, actually. So we are moving from this site to another site. We are now inside the Jewish quarter. Now, this also has to do with Khurban by Srishan, the first temple period. And what we can see over here is the Migdal HaYisraeli, the Israelite tower. That's what this is called. 
It's a tower from the time of Bayes Rishon, from the end. Again, time of Tzidkiyahu. This all has to do with that time. Um, the time given by historians, the year given by historians is the year 586 BCE. Um, year given, uh, again, there's a lot to, to uh, discuss about the year, but all of this is going to be at that same time. The time of the Churban, the time that we're sad about tonight and uh, saying Kinas about. And so there's a tower over here, and we can see that the battle happened over here. There was a battle between our men and the Babylonians. And you can see pictures from different angles. We're all talking about this. Um, this tower, this Migdal HaIsraeli. Okay, now over here, this is what lets us know that we're talking about a place of battle from the time of the Churban, because these arrowheads are Babylonian. Nebuchadnezzar's men used these arrowheads to shoot at our men, and they didn't break through at that point. This point's actually the most convenient point to break into the city because it's in the north, and if you know Jeru Jerusalem's in a slant, it's the only ancient city in Israel that's not built on top of a hill, because all the other cities are built right on top of the hill, but Jerusalem's the only one which is built on the side because there's a water source at the bottom the Shiloh. We are moving on here. You can see just a, a model of Bayes Rishon, first temple period. And we are moving on to the second temple period. So we saw, till now, we've seen three different sites that have to do with the first temple period. We saw uh, by the city of David, area G, Achiel's house. And then we saw um, we saw the Migdal Israeli, the Israelite Tower. We're moving forward to the destruction of the Temple in the year 70 AD. This is more accepted that this is the exact year. The Churban of the Second Temple. And we are starting in the Herodian Quarter, actually. Uh, what's very interesting is you have, is in the Jewish Quarter, very close to the Churva, you have a series of houses from the time, it's called the Herodian Quarter, but it's, it's not a quarter and it's not Herodian. <laughs> Any guy that will tell you that, but it dates from the time of the destruction of the second temple. They're beautiful Roman houses. It is something very interesting. Um, there's a guy, there's a historian called uh, Michael Aviona, and he made the Holy Land model of the second temple period which used to be in, by the Holy Land Hotel, and today is by the Israel Museum. And so he put in an area where he thought you would find uh, poor houses in Jerusalem. And what actually happens is, when we dig, we don't find any houses of poor people in Jerusalem. Everybody that lived in Jerusalem at the time of the Chorban was rich. That's what archaeology tells us. Uh, the history books don't show it like that, but we've yet to find these poor houses. So we're talking about a very, very rich, beautiful city. And in this, what's called the Herodian Quarter, we have a few different houses that belonged to Kohanim. We'll look through this. And there's something specific, which I want to show you, actually. Um, if we look lower down, lots of mikvahs over here, lots of uh, mikvahs and, and big, nice houses. I want to get to one point over here. You can also see the walls over here. Beautiful frescoes on the wall, the way they drew. Um, by the way, the frescoes made the houses burn quicker. If the Romans would just go by and throw in torches, which is what happened, they throw in torches through the windows. So the frescoes, which is oil paintings on the wall, they catch fire. So the house, even though it's made out of stone, and it should be fireproof, it catches, the walls catch fire because of the, the paints on it. And this answers a question. It's a question we always ask, uh, especially about the Beis HaMikdash, the temple itself. How did it burn? It's made out of stone. So if you're drawing on the wall with flammable stuff, so it's going to catch fire. 
you can see it over here. You can see the, the grayish, blackish color on the wall from the fire from two, close to 2,000 years ago. And there's actually an area very close to here where you actually see uh, beams, wooden beams that were burnt. And we're moving on to another site, which is right nearby here. This is the burnt house, which is, it connects to uh, the Herodian quarter, uh, the houses that are right next to each other, all from the same period. Uh, what's at the bottom part of this picture is actually the sewage system. And the sewage system, you see part of it in the Herodian quarter, and then part of it here in the burnt house, and it's one system. Uh, the Romans were very developed. They brought lots of water into Jerusalem, and there was a whole system of a sewage system underground that took the water out, and people had bathrooms with running water. It was really, really a luxurious city. And after this, uh, Jerusalem doesn't have running water for till the British. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about 1900 years, uh, 1800 years later, the British were the ones who brought running water back to Jerusalem. And in these systems, actually it's very sad, it has to do with the Tisha B'Av, is that you find bodies inside these sewage systems. Some sewage systems actually had like a room that was connected. We see it by the city of David. You have the secret room, entrance to the secret room, and you actually find bowls which had food inside, which um, the Jews ate from because they were hiding from the Romans. Uh, the Romans would... Um, look for the Jews inside the gutters and kill them. Fascinating thing actually in the part of the sewage system which you find in the city of David is there's a gladius which is found over there. A gladius is a Roman sword. And what would that be doing inside the sewage? So what historians think is that a Roman soldier came in and he saw a few Jews inside there and he wanted to kill them, but they managed to beat him, you know, in a small space and you have a lot of people, you can beat even a Roman soldier who's well-trained and they took his sword from him. And 2000 years later, this is what we find inside the sewage system. And you can see more of this uh, sewage system. This is you looking in. Um, some places the sewage system is much wider. So here, also, it doesn't look like it was dug out properly, because you can see the bottom part over here has, uh, it's, it's, you're talking about earth, you're talking about dust that was filled in over the many years. And um, the sewage system does go a little lower than this, so people can actually get fit in, or at least in the part which is close to the Herodian quarter, people could fit in. Now, something very interesting that we find over here in this burnt house, is this weight that says the bar Katrus, the ca belongs to the Katrus, belongs to the Katrus family, the bar or the bay Katrus, the house of Katrus. And the house of Katrus is a house that we know and we recognize from the Talmud, the Gemara and Psachem Nunzain uh, speaks about a few families who were Kohanim, who were not good families. And the and the Katris family were not good guys. They're not remembered in a positive way. They would write hateful letters to different people, spewing hate. But we know this is what caused the second temple to get destroyed. It's because hatred between one another. We couldn't get along with each other. And here, here you see it. So we have the Katris family, and we know from the Talmud what, what they did back then and why they're not remembered in a positive way. Here you can see another picture of this weight that was found over here. Now here you can see different things that were found in this room, in this burnt room, sorry, burnt house. This is the burnt house. Burnt room is by the city of David. And you can see cups over here. Now these cups are made out of stone. And this all adds to the picture that we get that there were Kohanim living over here, and it was very important for them to stay tahor at all times, to stay pure. And we know that stone vessels don't get impurity. So it's very hard to make a stone vessel. You take a piece of stone and you have to cut it out into shape and then it can crack. And so 
but they did it because uh, they want to keep purity. It makes life much easier. Um, if it's if you don't do this, then you have to. If your cup gets impurity, some of them sometimes you can't even get the impurity. You can't get the tumah out, and you have to break it, like with uh, if it's made out of cheres, it's made out of pottery. Now. Now, over here, we can see uh, this is part of the movie that you see when you go to the burnt house. And it speaks about back then, you can see the different people, the different Jews that were living in Jerusalem and how they got along with each other or didn't get along with each other too well. And we know that this house got totally burnt. And when the archaeologists were digging over here, they had to dig through heaps and heaps of ash, ash from 2,000 years ago. They, they came out black when they were digging. And it's, it's, very, uh, it's a very emotional thing. You're digging and you're digging through ash of your great-grandparents from many years ago. And this was found over here. This is the, this is the arm of, some, uh, of a woman that was killed and she was actually holding, um, you find the head of a spear. So in the movie over here, they actually portray a, trying to fight with the Romans with the head of a spear, but um, the archeologists say that there must have been also the back part of the spear, the wooden part of the spear, which you wouldn't find in this instance because we're talking about a place that was totally burnt down. Everything was reduced to ash so that the wood that was holding the spear would have also been reduced to ash. And uh, what you have left is the metal that doesn't burn. This is more of the burnt house. And we are moving on from here. Okay, so this is, this is some, some of the charcoal, some of the ash from 2000 years ago from the debris, from what was being, what was burnt down by the Romans. All very, uh, very alive when you take a tour over here. And now sometimes they do weddings. Um, there's a picture I found on the internet. I actually haven't heard of actually weddings that were done over here. But uh, the idea is that we've, we've, we've come to a to happy end to the story that we're back in Jerusalem. We can do a wedding in the burnt house. I had to bring this picture along while I was showing you uh, the burnt house. We're going to move to a different site. Okay, so what we have over here is we're going down towards the western wall. We're going down, we are by the southern part of the western wall. What we can see over here is the Herodian Street. There was a road that Herod had built right along the western wall. The western wall's on the right here. This is the Kotel. And when we go to the Kotel, when you go to the Kotel, you, all you can see when you dive by it is 60 meters of the Kotel. That's usually when we think about the western wall, we think about those 60 meters, but we actually, the, the wall is actually much longer than that. It's a 500 meter wide wall. And you go a little south, of where you usually daven by the Western Wall, we usually pray and you get over here to the Southern Wall excavations. And down here we can see the Herodian Street and on the left side would have been shops from 2000 years ago. Not much is uh, left of this today, right? You can see it's all, it's, uh, it's been destroyed. There used to be an arch that went up on top of these shops, from the wall and on top of these shops. A beautiful arch, Robinson's Arch. It, obviously, Herod didn't name it after a British archaeologist, but we don't know what the actual name is. We don't know what the, what the actual name of this arch is. We are, you can see we're approaching the end of this tour. Now, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, they knocked this arch down, and in the ground you can see that um, there's a big hole in the Herodian street. That's from that arch that was pushed down by the Romans. 
And now in the back, you can see some stones. We're going to get a little bit of a close up on those stones. Okay, this is uh, where the arch was. You can see the way the wall protrudes over here. Uh, this is showing you that there was a very big arch over here. Now, okay, now we're right up by these stones. Uh, these stones, if you look at the corners of the stones, you can see that they're smashed. These stones were pushed down by the Romans. When the Romans are destroying Jerusalem, they're pushing down stones from the Western Wall. <laughs> they're trying also to get, if there are any Jews walking around, they're trying to throw the stones on top of them. And you could see by how it smashed, you can see how tall the wall was before. All these stones were beautifully carved, like we can see on the wall. Herod did a beautiful job. And it was pushed down from a high place and it smashed like this. Now, when the archaeologists dug over here, they discovered this pile of stones that the Romans had pushed down and they said, we're not going to touch this. This is the closest you can get to actually touching the destruction, touching the Khurban. And they left it here for us to see and really experience the Khurban. I come here uh, during the nine days sometimes and I'm with the uh, tourists, they see this, so they touch the stones and they cry. It's a very special place. We're going to move on from here right to the Western Wall. And this is actually where we're going to finish our tour. You see the Western Wall, how it, how it looked in, uh, before the days of Corona. There were times it was very packed. And thousands and thousands of people could come to the wall. And then I have some pictures from today. I was by the Western Wall last week. And it's a very different experience. These people are wearing masks. When you're by the wall today, what happens is it's all, it's divided. You have all these divisions and only, um, they allow 20 people in these capsules. And it's actually very sad. We came to the wall. We came with notes that we had prepared. I came with the whole family. And to get to the wall, you had to wait in the line. It was a very long line. You can see, by the way, on the left side of this picture, all those people, <laughs> that's where the line is. Uh, they only allow somewhere, I don't know how many people, 50 or 100 people by the wall. I think it's close to 100 people by the wall. And so you have to wait in line. You have to wait till somebody leaves so that you can go up to the wall. And we all know that a few months ago, it wasn't like this. And it was a place that you could just come and go right up to the wall. So this, Tisha um, B'Av, we find it hard to cry and to connect to the Khurban. But uh, when I come to the wall today and I see, I see well, what's happened and how, um, how difficult it's to become to come close to the wall, I can, uh, I can even cry just, just by seeing this. Now, I just want to speak about the wall for a moment. We have uh, the Western Wall. It says in the Talmud that the Holy Presence has, has never left the Western Wall. It's the one place that still holds on to that Holy Presence. And it's the one wall that survived it, well, not in its entirety, but it survived much more than all the other walls. And so it's a very special part of, of the the Beit HaMikdash, what was the Beit HaMikdash once, what was the temple. And maybe to help us understand this, we can think about a story I once read about a woman that survived the Holocaust. Her town in Europe was destroyed. Um, whole family was killed in the Holocaust. And she managed to survive the camps. And all she has left with her from back then is a picture that she looks at every now and again, and she remembers what it was like back then in the days of glory. And so when we come to the Western Wall, the one place that still holds on to that Holy Presence, we can remember what it was once like. We can connect to Jerusalem from 2,000 years ago, and people come there and they cry. And even people that didn't grow, grow up in a Jewish school, don't have much of a Jewish background, they come here and, and they feel the connection. It's still there. And so we really hope that uh, the... Beit HaMikdash will be rebuilt and we can rejoice and, and feel that glory again. I just, before I, I just want to, oh, 
Okay, just that there's some questions over here, just before we actually end this meeting, um, answer questions on the chat, if you want to send questions on the chat. How deep is the ground? How deep in the ground are the bulas? The bulas aren't deep in the ground. Uh, they were found, well, the whole area had to be dug out. Um, what were you we talking about? Maybe three or four meters of debris and stuff to get there because it's in a room and it was totally immersed in, in earth. And then they found the bulas sitting in the room. Okay. You guys can um, feel free to contact me. You can email me. My email is uh, Israel with a smile at gmail.com. That's no smiley faces or anything, just Israel with a smile at gmail.com. It was um, wonderful that everybody came here. A lot of uh, participants. Um, we connected with the first temple period, we connected with the second temple period. And Hopefully our Tisha B'Av is more meaningful now. And uh, we still have a, a whole day, uh, the whole of tomorrow ahead of us. And Be'ez HaShem, it should be, a, should be a good Tisha B'Av and we should uh, mourn properly and uh, rejoice later on. Thank you for, for listening.